All right, coming up at number 126, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon by Pablo Picasso. For form, this is an oil on canvas, and this is an example of early cubism. For function, this was to show off the new style, but also, and more importantly, it was to show the truth of Montmartre life. So instead of these uh, female nudes that are reclining and beautiful and simply letting you look at their body, you have these five prostitutes who have caught you in the act of looking. They're challenging you, they're gazing at you, and they're very ugly, which is a major part in why this painting is so much of a breakthrough. So for context, know that that's breaking with tradition, and he's trying to show the true life instead of a false fantasy that French people were very used to. Next, we're going to take a look at the steerage, a photograph by Alfred Stieglitz. This is a photograph, but it is more associated with cubism than actual photography. His interest in shapes and forms instead of actual characters in the photograph are an attribution or a tribute to the concern about shapes and forms in cubism. For contents, this is a picture of a boat. You have the lower class on the bottom and the upper class obviously on the top. The geometric shapes are highlighted, such as the ropes and chains and the smokestack and the man's white hat in that circular highlight there right in the middle top. For context, there was an immigration issue going on in the world right now, and the artist did have some strong opinions about immigration. Uh, however, he said he was more concerned about elevating photography to an art level, very much like Nadar elevating photography to art. Next, we are going to have the first of two kisses by Gustav Klimt. This is an oil on canvas, but it also has added gold media. So pretty much any gold object he could find, including gold leaf or any kind of nugget or object that had a shiny gold finish was added onto the canvas. So it's somewhat of a collage. For function, this is glorifying love. Love is as precious as gold, he says in his painting. And this is coming at the end of the Victorian era, so it's going to be viewed as pornographic. For content, there's a man and a woman, they're embracing in this very sensual, loving kind of manner, which again was perceived as sexual at the time. Next up, we're going to see another kiss by Constantine Brancusi. For form, this is limestone on a wood base. That means it's stone. It's a sculpture, so it's supposed to be viewed in the round. That means that you're supposed to be able to look at it from all angles. For function, this is saying that love is timeless and everlasting, just like the materials from which it is made. That stone, it's going to last forever. For content, again, it's a man and woman embracing, but they have angular hair here, and they have one eye or two eyes. They kind of merge together. For context, this is looking back to the marble sculptures of Greece, but it's also combining with the folk art, especially of Romania, where Brancusi was from. For number 130, we're going to have the Portuguese by George Brock. For form, this is an oil on canvas, it's a painting, and this is an example of late cubism. For function, this sort of cubism was based on deconstructing reality. Instead of showing just one viewpoint, the artist sought to show multiple viewpoints all at once. And for content, you have basically abstract shapes and lines. Dull colors are typically what Brock uses. This is very industrialized and inspired by architecture. For context, this is during the Industrial Revolution. So Brock, as well as Picasso, were inspired by the invention of the camera. They thought of themselves as the Wright brothers, kind of inventing this new thing and bringing it into reality. It was also inspired by various new technologies, including manufacturing uh, things about these factories in major cities and electricity. Next, we're going to see The Goldfish by Henri Matisse. For form, this is an oil on canvas, and it is indicative of fauvism. However, you can just think of this as post-impressionism. For function, Matisse's philosophy was to show joy and pleasure in life using color and the way he was painting. For content, of course, there's goldfish swimming in a bowl. 
there's plants, they're on a table, but it has an odd perspective or an odd viewing angle that doesn't quite match up. And this, remember, is post-impressionism. So we are going on here with Monk and Starry Night and all of this, but a little bit after that, when Matisse was trying to move the focus from just pure emotion and into that color and brightness and joy and pleasure. Next up is Kandinsky's Improvisation number 28, second version. For form, this is an oil on canvas, and it is abstract, or at least abstracted. For function, this is expressing Kandinsky's feelings about World War I, or specifically about the chaos leading up to World War I. But he's also connecting art with music. That's why the title is called Improvisation number 28. That would be the title typically of a movement or a piece of music at the time. For contents, you're going to have some stark lines and some shapes and some color, but you also have a wave carrying a boat. In the back, you're going to see either a house or a lighthouse. So we do have these small represent representational images in here. For context, this is going to be pre-World War I, and you need to remember that Kandinsky, although he was painting the feeling of music, was also painting his feelings and the public's feelings about politics at the time. And here we have Self-Portrait as a Soldier by Kirchner. This is also an oil on canvas, and this is an example of German Expressionism. It's important to remember that Kirchner was German. For function, this is a personal narrative, an emotional or a psychological self-portrait, and you're going to see several of these within this unit and also in our last unit and our next unit. So this is becoming quite the theme in, in AP Art History. For context, you can see Kirchner, the artist, in uniform and the model in the back. Notice that Kirchner is missing his hand and also the model is missing his genitals. This both points to an emotional injury or a psychological injury because Kirchner did, did never actually fight and he never actually had a war injury. So he also feels emasculated because of that model lacking their sexual organs. For context, you need to know that this is going to be his feelings about the war, and you need to know about Die Brücke, which was the group that he formed. However, it was short-lived. And you kind of just need to know about Kirchner. He's very representative of German life at the time, and his life kind of follows that path up to Hitler and what Hitler did with famous artists like him. Next, we'll see another German artist, Kathy Kollwitz, and her memorial sheet of Karl Liebknecht. For form, this is a woodcut, so this is a print, and it's another example of German Expressionism. For function, this is the narrative of an important political story and the two different figures' deaths. And it's important to note that Kollwitz is telling their story, but she's doing it more from an observer's point of view, so it's not exactly propaganda. For content, you have the corpse, obviously, at the bottom, which is presented in a very Christ-like way. And you have the mourners all around, but you also have a baby and a mother, which was a common theme for Kollwitz. She liked to paint the actual sufferings of actual people, especially women and children. So you need to know about the context of the time period here. Remember what was happening with the socialist and the communist. Uh, any of that would be really great to include in an essay and good to know for the background of this painting. Well, print. And here we see Villa Savoy by the artist Le Corbusier. Now that was an alias, that was not his real name. For form, this is made out of steel, concrete, and glass, and this can be considered minimalist, but also part of the Dada movement and a little bit of early modernist. So safely, I would go with minimalist here. For function, this is a house or a summer retreat or a weekend retreat for the Savoy family. So the Savoy family did commission it. They're sort of the patrons, but this is not power of the patron. For context, this is an open space. The area around it is an open space. The top of the roof is an open space. There's open space inside. It's very bare. There's very white walls. There's no decoration at all, pretty much. And the artist really believed in a white paint called Ripplin, which is not required knowledge, but it's kind of fun and good to know. 
For context, you need to know about the artist. You need to know that his philosophy is that a house is a machine for living and therefore should not be anything else. And he really believed in health. He be believed in the cleansing of your body and also the cleansing of your soul and also the cleansing of Europe from these unwanted people, which is why he teamed up with Mussolini in the end to help design new cities for Italy. It was a whole thing. Uh, you just need to remember a house is a machine for living. And here we have composition with red, yellow, and blue by P.A. Mondrian. This is an oil on canvas painting and it has very geometric forms. For function, it doesn't look like this, but it's actually an, a call for order after the chaos of World War I. This is a political statement. It has a very much deeper meaning than the form initially suggests. For content, you have, of course, the primary colors and very architectural lines. They're laid out in this almost grid pattern. For context, this is post-World War I, and Mondrian believed that artists should have a role in rebuilding society, and he was trying to convince the public and different governments of the role that artists would play, and also that call for order. So it's important for you to remember that, that is an, this picture is not just about aesthetics. It actually has that deeper meaning. Don't forget it. And here we have the illustration from the results of the first five-year plan by Stepanova. For form, this is a photo montage or a cut paper collage. She's taken several photos and combined them, layering them one on top of the other before Photoshop was ever invented. For function, this is a propaganda narrative. And for content, you're going to see Lenin, the people of the USSR, and then the letters our USSR in Cyrillic. This is representing industry. You can see the electrical tower in the background. For context, that's what it's all about. Post-World War I, the USSR is recently founded. It's gaining power, but also the politicians and publicity of the country is making it seem a lot more powerful and forward-thinking and prosperous than it actually was. And this is that propaganda art driving that viewpoint home that the USSR is a major world power when it, well, it kind of was, kind of wasn't. Next, we will see Object or Luncheon in Fur by Merit Oppenheim. For form, this is literally a fur-covered teacup, and you need to associate this with surrealism and Dadaism. For function, it's dreamlike absurdity, and it does tell sort of a story, but that story is very surrealist. Uh, remember that the artist thought her tea needed to stay warm, so her tea needed a fur cup to go with it. So it's kind of that absurdity there. For content, of course, you have the spoon, the plate, the cup, all covered in fur. For context, this is born out of Sigmund Freud's philosophy of dreams and the dreamlike world that we have kind of being the driving force in our psychology. So art is really related to Freudian philosophy at the time, which is why we get these dreamlike landscapes and objects. Next, we're going to have Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright, by far the most famous architect that we have in the 250. For form, this is made of concrete, steel, and stones. And for function, it is a house. It does have a patron. However, you don't really need to remember that. For content, you have several balconies which jut over the water and they kind of coincide with the river. It has stones that are taken from nature or inspired by nature all around the house and floors that imitate the look of the water and the natural stone there. For context, a house should be one with the environment. It should be one with nature. So this is kind of the opposite of Le Corbusier and this other philosophy instead of a house being a machine, a house should be part of the world. Next up, we're going to have The Two Fridas by Frida Kahlo. This is an oil on canvas and it is a surrealist painting. For function, this is an emotional or a psychological self-portrait. We have several of those in the 250 this time. 
This is a narrative or a story about Frida's life. It's about Diego Rivera and the bus accident that she was in, which landed her in the hospital and ended up in many surgeries, and also polio that she had that damaged her leg. For content, this is twins of Frida. So the one on the left has the heart exposed and she's more vulnerable and she's wearing a wedding dress. And the one on the right has her heart uh, more closed off. So the medical references in here come from her time again spent in the hospital. She knew a lot about anatomy. Uh, her different dresses are important to remember because they're two parts of the same culture. And for context, Frida painted herself over and over because she said, I am the person I know best. So you need to know about Freud and dr uh, dreams, significance of that on surrealist art, and go ahead and put this with your other surrealism or Dada type of paintings and sculptures. Next we're going to have Jacob Lawrence, The Migration of the Negro, which is panel 49 from a series entitled The Migration Series. For form, this is tempera on board. It is a painting and you need to know that it is one in a very large series. For function, that series is telling the story or the narrative of the Great Migration, which is the movement of uh, black U.S. citizens from the South to the North. And it's a commentary on culture at the time. So this is saying that even though the people thought that they were going to have a better life in New York, they were still divided. They were still separated physically and mentally and culturally. And it's about those race politics in the northern USA at the time. Even though we thought it was going to be better, we are still oppressed. And you can see that visually here with that slash down the middle and just the differences between the characters on the left and on the right. For number 142, it's going to be called The Jungle by Wilfredo Lam. This is a gouache painting. Gouache is kind of a mix between watercolor and acrylic. It's really awesome to paint with, but it's just a different kind of paint. And this is going to be considered surrealism. For function, this is to counteract the popular view of Cuba as a party nation. So at the time, remember, it's all about your context. Um, Americans were wanting to go to Cuba because they thought, you know, let's go party in Havana and drink and smoke Cuban cigars and like have a good time. But this artist is saying, you know, no, that's not our, our culture. That's the way that you're viewing us. That's not the way that we really are. And he shows that with his content. There's not enough feet for the space. It's too crowded. He uses African masks instead of faces. And he also includes sugarcane, which was a major crop grown in the area to say, you know, this is how our life really is. And you're thinking about us all wrong. This is our actual national identity. For number 143, it's Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in Alameda Park. This is a fresco by Diego Rivera, the husband of Frida Kahlo. For form, you need to remember that it is a fresco, so it was on the side of a building painted directly into the plaster of the building. And this is considered surrealism. It says right there in the title, uh, it's a dream, and you can associate dreams with surrealism. For function, this is a commentary on Mexican history. It has hundreds of years of Mexican history in it. It has the politics, uh, the glorified politicians on top and the people directly on the bottom. And it has the attitudes of the time and all throughout history included. For content, you need to know this is hundreds of years of history, and you specifically need to know that it has the colonization of Mexico, the fight for independence, and the revolution, including modern, at the time, modern achievements. You need to know about the main characters in here, and you need to know that originally it had a statement that said God is dead, and people did not like it. It was even defaced, that people were extremely offended until he took the message off. I would highly recommend going on Khan Academy or watching a video about this so that you can be thoroughly prepared for the exam. Next up, it's our favorite fountain by Marcel Duchamp. This is called a ready-made because he did not actually make it. It is a urinal which he has tipped upside down and signed in a fake name. For form, you can remember that this is porcelain and it is very white because of that. And it is considered Dadaism, which is connected to surrealism, but not quite the same. 
For function, this is challenging directly the notion of what art is. It's a commentary on the highly pretentious critics of the time, like kind of, look what I made you display in your gallery show. For content, it's a urinal, and it also has our mutt written on the side. In 1917, you need to know that our mutt is not the artist. Marcel Duchamp is the artist. It's a joke. The whole thing is a joke. For context, uh, this was a changing art world. We're kind of moving on from these serious commentaries and into, I don't know, almost a funny, playful kind of thing, while also saying something about the, the world culture at the time, kind of turning the mirror on itself as well. Next up, you have Woman One by Willem de Kooning. For form, this is an oil on canvas, but it also has collage elements added onto the canvas. This is abstract expressionism, and it is the best example of what pure abstract expressionism was all about and what it really was. For function, this is a commentary on the American public, again, turning that mirror onto the viewers and the public and making them question themselves. And what they're questioning this time is what they idolize. And for content, it's a pinup model. That's how de Kooning uh, gets that function across. And for context, you need to know that this is an ode to Venus of Willendorf. So she has enlarged uh, memory glands and an enlarged stomach because that emphasis is being placed on reproduction. But in this one, he's used that to say, look what you're idolizing, what, look what you're putting your emphasis on for American women to be. It's challenging the popular culture and the view of what America thinks beauty is. Next, we're going to have the Seagram Building by the architect Mies van der Rohe. For form, this is steel and glass. It's modernist structure, but it's also covered entirely with a thin layer of bronze, which makes it pretty unique. For function, this was made to be the corporate offices, obviously, of the Seagram Corporation, and it's located in New York City on Park Avenue, and it's meant to be both pleasing and functional. For content, you have windows and the bronze-covered facade and the steel that looks like it's exposed, but it's not actually exposed, and it's part of that kind of aesthetic right there. It also has a plaza in the front, which is uh, unique and a new idea introduced by this architect. For context, his philosophy was less is more. So this is the first of its kind, and it was revolutionary because of that plaza and because his philosophy of architecture being less is more. Um, it's much imitated. We look at things today and we think this is a typical skyscraper, but this was really the first thing that we base that on, the very first design of a modern skyscraper. Next, we are going to take a look at the Maryland Diptych by Andy Warhol. Remember that a diptych is two images put together to make one. They have to go together to be complete. For form, this is a silkscreen print, or actually it's 50 silkscreen prints, all of Marilyn Monroe, and you need to associate this with pop art. Remember that pop art makes ordinary things extraordinary. It makes things pop, and it also has to do with popular culture, and Marilyn Monroe was a great epic symbol of what pop culture was at the time. For function, this is a commentary on American culture, obviously, but it's also an ode or a hymn to Marilyn, who had recently died of a drug overdose. So for content, this has 50 images of her. They're all a little bit different. And on the right side, you can see how she's kind of fading away from that brilliant color into her death. And she's kind of just being erased there on the very right-hand side in black and white. And for context, you should probably know that Andy Warhol was obsessed with celebrity and death, and he incorporated both of these things into this print. Here we have Narcissus Garden by Yayoi Kusama. This also needs to be associated with pop art for you. Uh, for form, this is basically a bunch of reflective spheres and it changes the environment. So these spheres can be put anywhere in the world. Right now they're actually located in Atlanta. 
looking at the balls or the spheres, you are actually looking at yourself because they are very uh, reflective. Imagine how political this could be if it was placed outside of Washington um, in the mall next to the Washington Memorial uh, around all those politicians, challenging the politicians to take a look at themselves. For content, Yayoi Kusama wanted the content of all of her artwork to be you. You can see yourself, you're part of the art, and for context, what stemmed out of that was happenings. Um, art is happening, you're part of art, the world is happening, life is happening, and you are part of it. It's that immersion, complete immersion within her art, as some of you experienced when we saw her exhibit in Atlanta. She also pioneered obsession art. Uh, she was obsessed with polka dots and still is at the age of 90. And this is a very early example of her obsession with polka dots because essentially it is a polka dot in 3D. Next, we're going to have The Bay by Helen Frankenthaler. And this is called a soak stain. It is a technique of pouring acrylic onto wet canvas. So it's watered down paint, poured onto watery canvas and it allows that to kind of spread into that form right there. She is considered an abstract expressionist, although she's kind of considered the second generation of that. Notice that her soak stains do not look anything like Willem de Kooning or Jackson Pollock, but she st still is considered abstract expressionism. For function, this features the colors and the shapes and it has that new painting technique, so she's kind of debuting that. For content, this has a blue blob and a green blob and a white blob. Uh, it's not supposed to be representational and that's all part of the function as well. The focus is supposed to be on the viewer's experience instead of the actual object. So while it is called the bay, it is non-realistic and the artist is wanting you to kind of interpret it for yourself. Number 150 is going to be Lipstick Ascending on Caterpillar Tracks by Klaus Oldenburg. For form, this was originally an inflatable tube of lipstick. However, now it has been changed to metal, so it can be more permanent. And it, this is on tank treads. Caterpillar tracks are the part of the tank that make it move. For function, this was a political protest on the war in Vietnam, and is located on the campus of Yale and was made specifically for the students. For content, it's literally a giant lipstick tube and ascending, it has those handles going up the top so you can climb it if you want to and it has the bottom part of a tank. This is a very large scale object and you do need to know that for form or content that it's taking up a lot of space and it's changing the environment that it is located in. For context, Klaus Oldenburg said, I am for an art that does something other than sit on its ass in a museum. I am for an art that imitates the human. So he's all about making art that is involving the human. It's about your experience. Just like the past several works that we've looked at, Oldenburg wants you to be involved in his art. And this is a really great way for the students of Yale to be involved with the art and involved in modern politics, specifically those of the Vietnam War. Next, we're going to have Spiral Jetty by Robert Smithson. For form, this is another very large scale object. Uh, in fact, you can go out and walk on it. It is meant to be walkable. For form, it is made out of the mud and the stones and the dirt in which it is located and it's in the middle of a lake, well, on the side of a lake. It is very, very large scale, which is hard to see in some of these pictures. For function, he's manipulating the environment. He's changing the way that we look at the environment and changing the way we look at art. His message is that you are an active participant in the art and you should be involved in it just how you should be involved in the world. For content, it has a whirlpool shape, a spiral. A jetty is a piece of land that sticks out into the water. And it also changes. It's going to change with time. This is a great example of how artists change the environment and manipulate it, but also how the environment changes art throughout time. It's located in Utah. You can visit it today, at least until it disappears. So you need to be able to say, uh, connect this with things like uh, an oxbow and a river that would change over time. 
And last in our unit, you're going to have The House in Newcastle County by Robert Ventura, Ace Ventura, architect. For form, you're going to have wood and brick, and this is considered postmodernism. For function, it was meant to be a house. People live in it. And for content, uh, everything is super, super extra. So it's overly decorative, it's whimsical and fantastical, and the interior is just covered in baubles and spears and arches and color and extra, extra everything. But it also has classical features like a pediment shape on the outside and an arch and some columns. For context, Ventura said, less is a bore. And he was going against Van der Rohe and kind of butting heads with him and saying, you know, architecture should be fun, architecture should be crazy, and it's kind of harking back to those Baroque days while Mies van der Rohe said, less is more, uh, Ventura said, less is a bore. All right, students, so that's going to be it for our Unit 8 review. Good luck and keep studying. Make sure you have all those flashcards done, your podcast, everything caught up, and I know you're all going to do really great on the test tomorrow.